Hi, I'm Dr. Stephanie Bernick. I am the Chief of Breast Surgery at Mount Sinai West, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about breast cancer. Uh, this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and uh, in this month we sort of celebrate all that we've accomplished in treating breast cancer, but uh, we also know that there's still a long way to go. Breast cancer affects approximately 240,000 women a year. About 20 to 30 percent of these women are under the age of 50, which uh, is young, and a thousand women under the age of 40 will die of disease. So one of the main uh, facts that we need to um, make women aware of is that if you have a breast mass, you really can't ignore that. You really should bring it to the attention of a healthcare provider so that the proper management uh, can be carried out. Uh, you're never too young for breast cancer. We actually see patients in their 20s with breast cancer. That's unusual, uh, but it can happen. So every breast mass needs to be worked up. Uh, and this should be directed by your primary care doctor um, and uh, possibly with a referral to a breast specialist. Many people want to know what causes breast cancer. The number one risk factor for breast cancer is just being a woman, so very hard to change that. Uh, the other things that you actually can modify are um, decreasing the amount of alcohol that one ingests. With each glass of alcohol, your risk of breast cancer actually goes up. Uh, you can exercise more. We found that when women are overweight, uh, there's more circulating estrogen and the thought is that this might stimulate the development of breast cancer. So anything you can do to maintain a healthy body weight, uh, decrease the amount of fat that's ingested, decrease the amount of alcohol that's ingested, uh, and eating a normal healthy diet really do help decrease the risk of breast cancer. However, there's no way to completely eliminate the risk of breast cancer because one in eight women will actually be diagnosed with breast cancer at some point in their lifetime. So this is a very large number. Um, the good news in all of this is that we have really come a long way in the treatment uh, that we offer for patients that are diagnosed with this disease. So we are actually doing chemotherapy less than we used to. We're able to target therapies um, we can actually look at the genetics of a cancer and with that try to make a decision if the patient needs chemotherapy or not. Uh, we have a greater number of anti-estrogens that we can give a patient to reduce the risk of cancer returning and also serves to treat a patient that's diagnosed with cancer. Uh, we still do mastectomies when needed. Uh, sometimes people have disease in different parts of the breast and we're unable to save the breast. The good news in that realm is that we offer excellent reconstructive options. And in fact, some women look better leaving the hospital when than, they, than when they came in. Uh, because we can use abdominal tissue from the abdomen. And when I remove the breast tissue, we leave as much skin as we can. We fill that skin envelope with tissue from the abdomen. So the patient gets a tummy tuck, they can get a breast lift uh, and have younger looking breasts than when they walked in the hospital. Uh, so that's good news. Um, of course, no one wants a mastectomy unless they have to have it. But we're happy as breast surgeons to be able to offer women uh, the ability to, to f still feel like a woman uh, even if the breast needs to be removed. You are tuned in to Greater Refuge Temple, the church in the heart of the city, with the people of the city in its heart. Praise the Lord and good morning, good Sunday morning to you. 
uh, we bring you greetings from the Greater Refuge Temple, the church in the heart of the city, with the people of the city in its heart, the church chosen by Jesus Christ for the blessings of multitudes, where the anointed Bishop Charles Wright Sr. is our pastor. And we praise and thank God that you have chosen to join us today. Uh, we're going to have a high time in the name of the Lord, and we've got a treat for you today. So stay tuned because I know you're going to be blessed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, at this time, our praise and worship team will come at this time and they're going to give us a song of worship and praise. Come on, if you would just lift your hands right where you are. I think you begin to just whisper sweet words of worship to the Lord. Come on, give them your offering of worship on this morning. Come on, that's it. Open your mouth. That's it. Hallelujah. Come on, praise team. Help me say it. You, Lord. Yeah. 
bless him right there. He's worthy, yes he is, yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Wasn't that a beautiful selection? Here is my worship. Yes, we worship the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because God is good to us and his mercy endureth forever. I want you to know that the Greater Refuge Temple has you in mind and our pastor and our the members and officers of our church, we're constantly praying for you. For those of you who are connected to the Greater Refuge Temple through membership, even though we are socially distant, we are still spiritually connected with you and we have you in mind. Do you mind if we pray for you on this morning? Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you and we praise you. We love and we adore you, Father. We thank you, God, for my brothers and sisters who have joined us by the way of live streaming today. Lord God, those who, Lord, are struggling in many ways, Lord God, or in different ways, we ask that you touch them now. From the crown of their heads to the sole of their feet, we ask you to bring new life. We ask you, God, to anoint them afresh. God, we ask that you bind the hand of the enemy. God, we ask that those uh, who are under the sound of my voice who are sick, we ask that you heal them now. Lord, those who have heavy spirits, hung down heads, we rebuke the hand of the enemy in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we speak peace, we speak joy, we speak deliverance in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask you to bless those who are in hospital rooms and nursing homes. Lord, all of those who just simply need to know that you're there. Father, we ask that you wrap your loving arms around them now in the name of Jesus Christ. God, we ask that you bless the furtherance of our time together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you. At this time, we'll have another selection coming to us from our praise and worship team. Come on, put your hands together if you know that every praise belongs to God. Come on, worship team, I need y'all to make some Holy Ghost crazy noise. Come on, let's encourage them all today. Come on, help us in. Everybody, come on, help us in. Every praise, every praise to our God. To our God. Every word of worship. Every word of worship with one accord. Come and say every praise. Every praise. Every praise.
Yes, every praise. Yes, we worship and magnify the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and give every praise to Jesus Christ, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Yes, we're having a high time in the name of the Lord. And I know you're enjoying this time of worship with us. Uh, we want you to know that the Greater Refuge Temple uh, thanks you so much for your constant prayers and support. Even through this coronavirus, you have been wonderfully committed to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ here at the Greater Refuge Temple. Yes, the Greater Refuge Temple, the church in the heart of the city, with the people of the city in its heart, the apostolic headquarters of the world. You have been a blessing to us. And because of your efforts, we have been able to continue to uh, support our global mission efforts, our home mission efforts, our educational efforts, all the things that we do to make the lives of those uh, who are in need uh, be a blessing to them. And so we've praised and thank God for your gifts uh, that you give to the Greater Refuge Temple. So we want at this time for you to share in giving uh, now. Uh, this is an opportunity, a part of our worship. This is not an extension of our worship, but this is a part of worship. We worship the Lord in giving. And so we ask that you now prepare to give your tithe, give your offerings, uh, and you will see on your screen ways that you can give to the Greater Refuge Temple. You can simply give by going to the Givelify app and just simply going to the Givelify app, you'll see a picture of the Greater Refuge Temple and a picture of our pastor. You'll know you're in the right place because there are many Greater Refuge Temples. You want to make sure that your gifts go to where you want it to go. That is to the Greater Refuge Temple in New York City. So we want you to share in giving. You could also give uh, by simply going to your checkbook and writing a check and mailing it to the Greater Refuge Temple, 2081, Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. Boulevard, New York, New York, 10027. That address again, the Greater Refuge Temple, uh, 2081 Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard, New York, New York, 10027. And I know that God will bless you real good. Can we pray as you prepare to give your tithe, give your offerings to the Greater Refuge Temple? Can we say a special prayer together during this time? Yes. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for my brothers and my sisters who are sharing and giving. We ask that you now, Lord God, bless them as only you can. Bless the gift and giver. Lord God, there are perhaps some under the sound of my voice who heart's desire is to give, but don't have the means to do so. Bless them so the next time we come together in worship, we'll be able to share in giving together in Jesus' name. Everyone, repeat after me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Come on, say it from your soul. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Yes, thank you for giving. Thank you for sharing and giving. At this time, we're going to have another selection coming to, to us from our praise and worship team. And we have a treat for you today. We're going to give you another throwback message, but this is a very unique throwback message from uh, our former assistant pastor, uh, Bishop, uh, should I say, Apostle Dr. James I. Clark Jr., uh, who is our presiding apostle, the presiding apostle of the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith. He's going to share a wonderful message with us, compelling us to spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, to the world and to our community. I know you're going to be blessed uh, by this message. Please receive our praise and worship team and Apostle Dr. James I. Clark Jr. with this word of inspiration. But the scripture says, God is our refuge and our strength. God, we just thank you, God, for being everything. Come on, if you would just lift your hands right there and just bless him. Come on and just begin to just thank him for being everything, everything you are, God. For we have everything that we need, God. You're the great I am. Come on, open your mouth and bless him, yeah. Help me say it, I. Everything. I have everything I need. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I have everything I need. Look great I am. Look great I am. Provides for me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. again I
you know it. Come on, help us say it. Come on, I have. Come on, whisper these sweet words of worship to the Lord. I have everything I need. The great I am. The great I am provides for me. The great I am Thank you, Jesus. Come on, it says, you are, you are. Jesus, you are my strength. You are my strength when I am weak. Where I am weak, you make me strong. You are my strength when I am weak. The great I am. so much to thank the Lord for. I've got so much to thank the Lord for. When I look around and see what the Lord has done for me, I've got so much, so much, so much to thank God for. Come on, church. I've got so much to thank the Lord for. I've got so much Thank the Lord for When I look around and see What the Lord has done for me I've got 
so much, so much to thank the Lord for. So much to thank. Well, he brought me through the storm and rain. Church, he brought me through the storm and rain. When I look around and see what the Lord has done for me, I've got so much, so much, too much to thank God for. from a mighty long way some of us should have been dead some of us should be in the hospital amen but God watched over us and blessed us and brought us to this moment hallelujah our hearts should be on fire we amen is uh, should be sh sharing in our hearts and in our testimony as David I was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. He's a wonderful God, a wonderful, wonderful God and Savior. I want to speak to you for a little bit from the book of Romans, chapter 12, uh, verses, uh, amen. Uh, really, I'm going to cut it short. Verses 12, 1 to 3, amen, and uh, trust you open your Bibles and go there uh, with me. Let us pray. Oh God, our Father, we worship you today. We thank you for this moment, for this opportunity to come into your presence and to magnify your name. We have so much to thank you for. Not only have you, oh God, blessed us to see this day, given us the energy and the strength to function and to even come to the house of worship and to bless your name. We thank you for watching over us down through the years and for watching over our loved ones, our family. We're so happy, oh God, to be in this house. Oh God, where your name is being lifted and the praises of God, hallelujah, are being sent over the media to touch the lives of those who are shut in, those who are thousands and hundreds of miles away. We want to bless your name again for the privilege to fellowship with so many of our friends, our sisters and brothers. We thank you, God, for the presence of Mother Dorothy Anderson, a co-laborer in the Caribbean and in this great ministry. You have kept her and blessed her. And for those family members who have devoted the love and care that she needs at this time. Father, we are thankful for our brothers who share the pulpit uh, with us today. Reminding us that no matter how difficult the journey, no matter how trying the circumstances, we're not in this fight alone. Yes, we have you, but we have those, oh God, who can hold our arms up, who can speak on our behalf and be there as a source of encouragement and uplift. We ask and pray that as this commemoration comes to a close, that the indelible impact and memory of the great leader of this house 
Amen. The late Bishop William L. Bonner will forever stand as a, oh God, standard against which we who preach will measure ourselves. And those of us who pray for and are concerned for the people of God, oh Lord, will see him as an example of what you can do in a life that is fully surrendered. We ask in prayer again, Lord, that you would look on this nation with compassion. We're in a difficult time. We're in trying times. Oh, God, there's a song we sing, and you inspired one of your servants to write it. Men will call things right and call right things wrong and wrong things right. Oh, God, and they are doing so today with no inhibition. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, no sensitivity for right and wrong, for evil and for righteousness. And so we list our prayer with the millions around the world who are crying out to you today and praying, move, Lord. Move, Lord Jesus Christ, the power of evil. Move, oh God, against those who don't care for human life or well-being. Move, Lord, oh God, against the spirit of greed. The hatred, oh God, the white supremacist influences that have shaped so much of what's happening in this culture. Move, Lord Jesus. Move among us, oh God, that the need, the recognition of what we really need is another baptism of the Holy Spirit. Oh God, to help us to uh, break all the barriers that stand in the way of our getting close to you so that you can infill us and renew us and empower us to boldly declare the word of God and to bear witness, even to be as Jesus called the church, the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We ask these blessings in your precious name. Grant your servant anointing for this moment. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Let all the people of God say hallelujah. I am... Uh, want to spend some time talking a little bit about uh, praise God and I seem to be uh, following this theme but I'm very concerned uh, about how we uh, are seen in the world um, um, I, we, we have preached and taught so much about coming out of the world that it seems that we no longer recognize that, amen, we are in the world, but not of the world, to win the world to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, uh, this particular passage is very helpful. It was written by the Apostle Paul around A.D. 57 and 58, while he was in uh, Corinth, it is believed, on his third missionary journeys, written to the saints, in the great city of Rome, which had a population of about 4 million people. And I like to say that and give a little, amen, context because, uh, amen, too many of us are uh, not making the, the applications that need to be made uh, when we uh, teach or preach or study the word of God. Amen. We interpret the scripture, take it into consideration who wrote it, and the culture and circumstances in which he lived uh, and who read it, and the same for them, praise God. But, amen, we have to understand it was back there then, but the same power that God made available through his word and through the power of the Holy Spirit is available to us today. Being in a great uh, metropolitan center is no hindrance to the power of God where the people of God, amen, are excited about being the people of God. And uh, because of that, I want you to, praise the Lord, turn with me as I read this passage, praise the Lord, from the Apostle Paul, where he writes, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but ye be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me, 
that every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Let the church say amen. amen. Now, there are two very important uh, points the Apostle Paul makes in this uh, section. There's the practical side of his prior teaching. Uh, be not conformed to the system. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is important, amen, that we understand that at this particular point, Paul is launching into the practical application or the practical, beha practical behavior of the church after he spent 11 chapters talking about the wonder of God's, amen, uh, blessing upon humankind. God came into history to rescue us from the consequence of man's rebellion against him. And so Paul spends time talking about sin and justification by faith. He talks about the righteousness that should follow and ensue once one commits oneself to Christ. And he talks about grace, amen, the undeserved favor of God upon undeserving humankind, God's favor, giving it uh, amen to those all of us, of course, who are not deserving of it, but God choosing uh, to bless us. If you're saved today, you ought to give God a big shout. Amen, Amen because you didn't earn it. You, 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 you didn't inherit it. You can't inherit it. Uh, it's not in your bloodline. It's not in your genes, God help us. Praise the Lord. God just chose to bless you. Even our older pioneers knew that. They used to sing, he didn't have to, Bless me, but he did. Amen. And they were ecstatic about it, and we ought to be ecstatic as well. Paul goes on, and he talks about the law, that is the dietary and the legal law that guided the uh, moral behavior of the, uh, of, the, 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 of the Jews, the Old Testament behavior. And, of course, he talks about holiness. And then, uh, amen, when he, uh, the emphasis he places upon the power of God in delivering us Praise the Lord from the work of the enemy. Hallelujah. He lets the church in Rome know uh, our, your bondage does not have to be forever. You can be liberated from the condition you're in. And if you want to get an insight into what that was like, you should, when you get home, read the Romans chapter 7 verses, uh, the, the last uh, well, a few verses from verse uh, 22, where the apostle Paul uh, elaborates what human, what the human condition was like. Amen. He says to himself, I know what is right to do, but I don't have the power to do it. Amen. Have you ever been in that situation? I, I'm sure somebody who was an addict uh, can answer yes to that. Somebody, praise the Lord, who had some other kind of affliction or condition can admit, yeah, I knew what to do, but I was powerless to do anything about it. And the Apostle Paul, that was the human condition. That was the condition of all humankind. And it seems that he reached a point of desperation. He cries out, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Amen. And he went on to say, oh, I thank God. Praise the Lord. And he goes on to elaborate the blessing of Jesus Christ and Romans chapter 8 and 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. But God had to take the initiative. And if I were you, I would give God a praise right now. Amen. Hallelujah. For looking beyond our faults and seeing our need. Amen. The, so the first point he wants us to understand there. After all that God has done and the guarantees we have, we have an obligation. Now, we, we can't save ourselves. There's nothing you could do to save yourself, no matter how much you have, your education, your status in society. Etc. It doesn't work. Only God can deliver us. And God chose to do that, amen, by sending his son who gave his life, amen, and satisfied the righteous wrath of God, amen, that we by having faith in Jesus Christ, could be forgiven our sins. Amen. And I'm so ecstatic about that. I'm so excited about God looking beyond my faults and seeing my needs. Amen. I, don't, I never get tired of shouting about it, nor do I get tired of talking about it. That's why you're hearing it now. But the first negative point, he says, be not 
conform, amen, to this world. Be not conformed to this world. This comes from the Greek word which denotes union with altogether. That is by association, companionship, process, resemblance, possession, instrumentality, addition, etc. And the other term is kama, fashion, fashion alike, to conform to the same pattern, conform to or fashion yourself according to. So the first thing Paul wants to say, based on what I've just outlined for you in the chapters, the 11 chapters that precede this, don't be conformed. You're saved. He's talking to the church of Rome. Amen. What God has done for you, no one else could do for you. Amen. And what God has done for you is complete. And all you have to do is live right. That's not as simple as it sounds, but that was, that's exactly what he's saying. Be not conformed to the world. You're in the world, but you make some hard choices. Amen. We don't like to talk about that now. We have psychology, sociology, statistics, and statistical averages, and all these things explain why you can justify this, justify that, and the other. Amen. But I have a sneaking suspicion, since I haven't found it in the Scripture, that none of these things will influence the decision the Lord Jesus Christ will make in the final day when we all have to stand before the judgment seat and answer to the Lord. Let the church say hallelujah. I am in a Pentecostal church, right? All right. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen to what 1 Peter says. 1 Peter 1 and 14, he says, As obedient children, not fastening yourselves to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation or behavior, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. I'm not talking about some of the things that people refer to as holiness. I'm talking about holiness of heart and disposition. I'm not talking about, and I may offend some folks, I'm sorry, but get over it. Amen. I'm not talking about the clothes you wear or you don't wear. Amen, because if you're holy the way you ought to be, you will, look, you will automatically function and live and act in a way that will bring glory to God. The second positive point, he says, be transformed. So there's one thing you shouldn't do, but there's something else that is available to you. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Comes from the Greek word metamorphose or morphe, the real thing of a man or a woman. It is the very nature and essence, the inseparable part, the unchanging shape of a person. Thus, the believer, you and I, must undergo a radical change within our inner being in order to escape the world and its doom, which God has made possible in Jesus Christ. To be a true believer, saints of God, then one must be transformed, changed inwardly, the real self-character, one's very nature, essence, character, inner being, one's inner self must be changed in order for this to happen. There must be the birth of a new spirit. The Lord promises such a change. In Ezekiel, for instance, he's talking to prophet, and they're looking at the awesome or the awful condition of a uh, uh, Judah, and he says to him uh, in Ezekiel 36 and 26, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh, a heart sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. This new being is of divine origin. John 1 and 13 John writes, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. You know, I'm still trying to uh, accept uh, the designation as a child of God. Uh, I, I'm not denying it. I'm, I'm just telling you how difficult it is to embrace fully that distinction that you and that I should be called a child of God. Does, does that amaze you? I mean, why are we so matter-of-fact and so casual about it? Do you know who God is? Well, you, I'm sure you heard who God is. And to be called a child of God? Yeah. 
You know, I can remember, of course, we had our first black president, and I must admit, I, I walked a little straighter. Uh, I worked a little harder to be cool, you know, because he, he was a model, an example. Amen. And if somebody had called me and said, Clark, do you realize that your relative is connected to Obama? Now, I'll say this to illustrate the point, but you know that's not like me. Well, let me put it another way so I don't have you walking out of here thinking it is like me. Some folks, you wouldn't be able to talk to them because they're connected with someone significant, someone important, someone wonderful. Oh, hallelujah. And here we are. You know the conditions and circumstances. A man, you came into the world and how you came to Christ. You know where you were before Jesus picked you up and turned you around and filled you with the power of the Holy Ghost. And to have somebody refer to you as a son of God, as a daughter of God, as people of God, we ought to be ecstatic about that. Put a smile on your face. Square your shoulder. Get a hallelujah in your praise. Look what God has done. Someone wrote a song, Amazing Grace will always be my song of praise, for it was grace that bought my liberty. I do not know why Jesus Christ should love me so. He looked beyond my faults and saw my need. Do I have a witness in here? I said, do I have a witness in the house? It's Shakar. Paul tells us, how then is this transformation to take place? Okay, you said I should be transformed. But how, did it, how does it happen? Well, Paul offers us an explanation. He tells us by the renewing of the mind. Can I say that again? Yes. If you're going to be transformed, and God knows musicians, I love music. I love every one of you. But it's not going to be by music. Amen. Unless it's the word set to music. Paul says this transformation that is essential and required by us as believers is an effect, is a function of the word working in our hearts to change our minds. Oh, hallelujah, to change our attitudes, to give us a different perspective, to give us a divine look at reality. I know I have a witness in it. There's somebody in here who knows what I'm talking about. It means a renovation, a renovating or being renovated. The idea of being to make as good as new. This is essential to a spiritual vision. Look at Romans 12 to be when you get home where Paul writes in the B portion, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Anachronosis, to be made new, readjusted, changed, Turn around, regenerate it. it. Seems to me we're going for transformation. We're going to be pretty busy. We don't have time to waste time. We have time to talk about people. We have time to be critical of anybody. Hallelujah. We're so busy working on ourselves by digesting and taking in the word of God. Hallelujah. And the joy, amen, that being transformed. Now, understand transformation does not happen all at once, 100%. Get rid of those. No, don't get rid of them. Just hear them and don't believe them. Folks who think that you're perfect. To be transformed is not to be perfect. For there's no one perfect but God. But what begins is a process of bad things being taken away and new things through the word of God being imparted. Oh, hallelujah. And only God can do that. And he does that through the power of the Holy Spirit. Why so radical change or change? One, one, one may ask. And I want to give you just a little example 
of why God could not just pat somebody on the back, Adam and Eve, and say, okay, cool, I'll forgive you, go on and do the right thing. What Adam and Eve did, however you may view Genesis, praise the Lord, the, the message from Scripture was so radical that God had to create a whole new something in them. The reason I insist that I make this point is because of the damage sin has done to the human mind, which is tragically corrupted by sin. According to Paul, the human mind has become vain, empty, and futile in its imaginations. You'll see something like this in Romans chapter 121. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. The natural mind has become a reprobate. In other words, incorrigible. It can't be fixed. When you study the law in Bible class under Dean Wright, I know he and the other uh, professors, are, uh, one of the basic things they taught you is that the old nature is unchanged and unchangeable. That's why Christ had to create a new nature. Isn't that for what 1 Corinthians 5 and 17 says? If he man in, if any man or woman be in Christ Jesus, they are what? A new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Hallelujah. Romans 8 and 28, Paul writes again in this same book. And even as they did not like to retain God, in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which were not convenient. Read it through verse 32 when you get home. Now the natural mind has become carnal and full of enmity or hatred against God. The natural mind is at odds with God. Of course, if your eyes are open and your ears are open, you can see that in the world. Amen. Hallelujah. The uh, Romans 8 and 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against, enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law or the principles of God. Neither can be. The natural mind has become blinded by Satan, lest it believe the glorious gospel of Christ. Paul writes again to another church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of those who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Don't play with the devil. I know I can say that without hesitation because one, it's true, but two, I'm in a Pentecostal church and somebody should have said amen to that. If Satan gets your mind, you'll do things you thought you would never do. You will say things that you said you would never say. When the enemy blinds you, you're helpless, you're powerless. The only thing that can help you is the power of God. The natural mind has become full of vanity, futility, and emptiness. Paul writes to another church, Ephesus chapter, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17. This I say, brethren, uh, this, I, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understandings darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Remember, I'm trying to explain to you why it's so important for this radical change. The natural human mind is focused on earthly things. Paul writes to the saints in Philippi, Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 through 19. For many walk of which I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory 
is their shame who mind earthly things. The human mind, the natural mind has become alienated from God and is an enemy to God. Paul writes to the church in Colossae, Colossae, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 21. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. That's what God did for us. Because the carnal mind is against God, for it is not subject to the law or the principles of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And for those of you who, amen, might see this as jargon, I want you to understand that flesh does not mean your finger or your toe or your leg or your back. It's the natural you. And some friends who are specialists in counseling and psychology has made me to know and appreciate, amen, that the natural you, amen, is composed of everything you ever experienced in life. That you, that you that existed before the Holy Ghost took control in your life. That you that was abused when you were a child. That you. That trafficked in drugs and any other thing. That you is still existing. And that's what causes the tension when the new nature, when the new you that has been created by faith in Jesus Christ, that tension, that tension comes from the old self, the old self called the flesh in the Bible, meaning the natural you is at odds with the new you and will not rest until a man, if possible, it can bring you down. So there has to be a radical alteration in you. I know it's running late and I don't want to be boring to you, but it is important for you to know, it is, it is important for you to know that the mind that you lived and guided you and directed you until you got saved does not go anywhere. What the new you, what the new nature that God creates in you and the disciplines essential to help it develop like prayer, fasting, studying the word, meditation, fellowship those are critical to the development of that new nature and if you don't do that you disadvantage the new you so that the old you even though you have the holy ghost has very minimal influence in your life That's why we need a radical change. I don't do this ordinarily, but I, I, I wish you'd help me preach this this afternoon and tell somebody sitting next to you, we need a radical change. We, we need a radical change. Paul tells Titus that the human mind has become defiled. Titus 1 and 15, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Paul illustrates this again most profoundly, amen, in Romans chapter 21 and 25. And I shared that with you, uh, amen, amen. Um, let me, let me just read this quickly to, to, to those who may not have any, have any familiarity uh, with the Word of God. Listen to what Paul says about this wrestling that goes on. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he says, I thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So 
the human mind being in this grave state, we make a grave mistake to have or seek to maintain this kind of mind, the carnal mind. Thus, the point of Paul's admonition to the church at Rome and to us today, a transformation of the mind must take place. How does one experience this transformation? How, how, how do I get this? The mind is renewed by the presence and image of Christ in the life of the believer. When you get saved, that's supposed to cause a new way of seeing. A new way of seeing. And a new way of seeing affects a new way of feeling and behaving. When a person truly receives the Lord Jesus Christ in his or her life, they experience transformation or new birth. Jesus' words to Nicodemus, remember that? In John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8, he says, amen, uh, concerning this, you must be born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The supporting scriptures to that is 1 Peter 1 and 23. The believer becomes a new creation, a new person. Paul writes it to the church in Ephesus again, Ephesus, Ephesians 4 and 24, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. In other words, once you become saved, you now have capacities to do things that you could not do prior to salvation. And that's why he says, you put on the new man. It would be unreasonable for God to challenge us to put on the new man had we not been given the power to do so. So God has a solution for the, uh, the, for the old nature and he grants us by the power of the Holy Spirit the capacity to develop and build the new nature that God performs in us, amen, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And finally, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 17, 517, which I quoted earlier, therefore, if any man be in Christ or woman be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. Thus, changed and empowered, the believer is not to walk as the world walks in the vanity of its mind. He or she should think on the things that bring peace and virtue. You know that scripture in Philippians chapter 4 and 8, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are honest. You know that scripture? Think on these things. And now you have the capacity. And if you engage in that process, new things start happening. Oh, yes. I mean, you have clapping in your hand. You have running in your feet. You have a song in your heart. These are the functions of that transformation. Praise the Lord. Some things are harder. It takes more time. That's why the church should not only be engaged in evangelism, it should be engaged in discipling of people. Something that takes a while. It don't pop your finger and already you're in. I'm not fussing. I'm just... I'm very, very, very much on fire about this. One must arm oneself with the same mind as Christ in bearing suffering. First Peter 4 and 1. For as much then, as Peter writes, as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. The believer must let the mind of Christ be in him or her by walking before the world under the authority of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Whose authority are you walking under? Who's directing you? I I'm serious. Like the who, who really is directing you? Who's counseling you? Who do you consult with? in planning and making decisions. I mean, who really holds sway in your mind? I'm talking to the church, but I'm also talking to those who are not saved. You can have help to live in this crazy world. Yes. 
you can have power over fear, over depression, over the things that are driving you crazy now. The power of God is sufficient to destroy every yoke. Either that's true or the Bible is not truthful. But my Bible tells me, amen, that God in the life of a believer is able to empower them to run through troops and jump over walls, to pull down high places, to stand. Victory over the world is achieved by renewing one's mind. More, no more, and no less. Therefore, we must do what the scripture enjoins us to do, and I'm coming to a close. Victory over the world. Now listen, when I talk about the world, I'm not, gonna, I'm not talking about the beautiful world that God created, the Grand Canyon and the, all the things that have evolved out of Praise the Lord, its existence. Because when God created the world, he saw it was good. And while there are things happening, of course, we know the world is being exploited by greed. Amen. And it's impacting our, uh, our weather and our potential for long life, etc. all of that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about men and women who don't know God, aren't concerned about God. And Paul is saying to the church then and to us now, given what Christ has done for you, don't be conformed to what you see. I don't care who the celebrity is. If you're in Christ, have the kind of relationship with God that the Holy Ghost will enable you to discern what is edifying, what is edifying, what is uplifting, what will empower you to carry out God's divine will in your life. Yes, we should be in the world, but not of the world. We should be engaged in social justice, standing for right treatment of our fellow human beings. Yes, we should renounce everything that is corrupt and strive with all the energy that God enables us to bear truth. How should we then live? Francis Schaeffer asked some years ago. And this is, uh, this is a good question, a good way to end this. This is how we should live in this world. One thing our forebears had that is unchangeable, unbreakable. They ought to be able to distinguish us <laughs> from the world. Not because we're acting crazy and doing stupid stuff because anyone who is saved and following Christ can't be stupid shouldn't be stupid let me put it that way not because we're strange that word is peculiar in the Bible doesn't mean that you're strange half-witted what else can I say that would shock somebody can't think of it right now. But the very presence, the very manner in which we present ourselves, and more importantly, the way we handle the tragedies of life, you and I know that being saved does not prevent you from having death in the family, Amen. sickness, and uh, lost jobs, and uh, these things will happen. But there's something that makes you stand out, not because you're trying to be you know, super deep or whatever they want to call it. But one writer put it in a song. He said, there's something within me that holdeth the rain. There's something within me that banishes pain. There's something within that I cannot explain. All that I know. All that I know. Although all hell is breaking loose. 
Although it seems like the demons have cornered me, on the other side, I have a peace of God that passes all, all, all understanding. Hallelujah. I told you, you were going to be blessed by those wonderful words from our presiding apostle, Apostle Dr. James I. Clark, Jr. I know that you feel inspired to do and to be a part of the Great Commission, and that's to spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to the world. So I know that as a child of God, you will do your best to tell your friends, your neighbors, uh, and all you come in contact with that Jesus Christ is the answer for the world today. And above him, there is no other way. Well, this has been a great time together, and certainly uh, we look forward to us coming back together uh, and to worshiping uh, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ as a church family and as friends of our church family. We will be so excited to see you back here on Sunday. But I want to also invite you and let you know that today at 4 p.m., I give you a special invitation to join us for a special service right here on Facebook Live. Uh, you can join us. We're going to have a special service uh, that is going to be a blessing to you. Our speaker will be our uh, former uh, presiding apostle, Apostle Matthew Norwood. It will be a global mission service. I know you'll be blessed uh, through our global mission service on this afternoon, District Elder Samuel Chris, who is the director of our global missions department locally, uh, has planned a service that I know you will be blessed by. So join us at 4 p.m. right back here on our Facebook Live page, on our YouTube page, or on our uh, website. You will be blessed of the Lord through the words of Apostle Matthew Norwood. Can I pray for you as we go? Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for this time that you've given us, and we thank you for your word and all the singing. Everything that has been a tremendous blessing to us, we ask that you now bless us until we meet again in Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. In the